Hi, good morning. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah they can hear me at the back. That's always helpful. Um, so as George mentioned, today is Anti-Slavery Day, and I just want to sort of contextualize that what we're actually talking about. Modern slavery is the illicit trade in human beings. They're turned into commodities to be bought, sold, exploited for vast profits with little chance of any punitive action ever being taken against their perpetrators. It's a trade that affects men, women, children of all ages, all creeds, all economic backgrounds, regardless of educational achievement or not. And last year in the UK, we saw nearly 4,000 victims from 102 different countries identified as potential victims. And amongst the adults identified within the UK, UK nationals were the fifth most prevalent, and within children, the UK now tops victims. It's an illicit trade that, according to the International Labour Organization, is worth at least $150 billion profit per annum. That's profit, not turnover. So let me contextualize. That's more than the profits of Apple, Facebook, Samsung, Vodafone, and Microsoft put together. Global estimates for the number of victims are around 40 million. In the, in the UK government, it will currently admit to at any one time there are 13,000 people held in situations of slavery within the United Kingdom. But the National Crime Agency and police say that figure is just the tip of the iceberg. But those numbers are just too big to comprehend, aren't they? And what happens when we hear those numbers is that we remove ourselves from the story. So let's just try a little quiz and say, well, how many slaves work for you? If you eat food, you have a smartphone, and you're wearing or own cotton clothing, then just because of the nature of the globalized world that we now live in, 40 to 60 slaves are furnishing your lifestyle, and you've done nothing about it. But if you got your nails done at a cheap nail bar and your car washed at a hand car wash on many of the streets in Bristol, then it's entirely possible that a slave did your nails or cleaned your car. So are we now connected with the issue? It's a hidden crime. It's a trade that takes place in plain sight, but it's a supply and demand trade that is driven really by our addiction to cheap. We want cheap goods, cheap services, cheap labor, cheap sex, cheap organs. So it's a global problem, it's a societal problem, and as our current Prime Minister says, it's the greatest human rights issue of our time, but it's a problem that you and I are complicit in because of the nature of globalization. Globalization has lifted a billion people out of poverty, but it's plunged millions into forced labor exploitation. But it's hidden in plain sight. So how do we build resilient societies? Why discuss this issue at a festival looking at future cities? regardless of whether today is anti-slavery day or not. Well, the world's on the move. The momentum that began in the industrial age, that movement from the countryside to the urban, is now at full tilt around the globe. It's in cities where we find most victims, and it's in rural environments where we find victims who are supplying the goods and the services that head towards the cities. In the UK, we've seen landmark legislation introduced, we've seen political focus at a national government level, and we now see that focus going around the world. But legislation and government policy are both blunt instruments and necessary tools. And it's at the localized level, at the city level, that we can see the greatest impact at, and the transformation of lives affected by this issue. So what do cities need to do to tackle modern slavery and change the equation which is currently low risk, high return, to high risk, low return. The devolvement of power, certainly in the UK, to the local level has seen the creation of elected mayors and PCCs, supposedly allowing for greater focus on issues that matter at the local level. Now I know that when campaigning, modern slavery might not be an obvious vote winner or a campaign issue, but it is an issue that has embedded itself into the very fabric of our society and needs to be tackled. Bristol, where we are, has said it wants to be at the forefront of tackling these issues. But how are we doing? I would say we're uniquely placed, because of our history of the transatlantic slave trade, to offer a world-leading response to the modern-day slave trade. But we're not there yet. And other cities, such as Nottingham, Liverpool, Manchester, have stolen a march on us. So what's needed? Well, it's a multi-agency, multi-stakeholder response. 
and we have the embryonics of it here in Bristol. We have an anti-slavery partnership that Unseen and the police chair that is now right across the southwest, and it's a model that's been looked at across the UK. We need the engagement of the business sector. We have legislation that requires big businesses, over 36 million, to tell us every year what they're doing to tackle modern slavery in their supply chains and business practices. The Business West Initiative supports Unseen, supports the call for greater effort by business to get involved. And another startup in Bristol, Symantrica, has created a transparency and supply chains registry where all the reports that companies put out can be viewed and analyzed and assessed. Policing needs to have a focus and an understanding on the issue. It needs to be victim-led. PCCs need to make this part of their strategic action plan and fund it accordingly. Local government has a role to play around planning, inspection, support, coordination. But as, as I'm sure you're already, already aware, Bristol is also a city of sanctuary. Yet victims identified do not rank as sufficient victims in order to access housing and support. As the Americans would say, go figure. Public awareness, reporting. Unseen now runs the UK's National Slavery Helpline, making it easy for the public to spot signs and report them so that victims can go free. The media <coughs> need to continue to tell the stories, but at the same time without further exploiting the victims. Faith communities need to report and make people aware, especially of those that are in closed communities. And what are future cities? What about the use of technology to analyze problems? Heat mapping where vulnerabilities are, making it easier to report via apps, know who's made my products. Above all, it needs leadership, coordination, focus, and resources. And now that you know, as Wilberforce said, you can choose to look the other way, but that's not really an option, is it? So, Marwa, over to you, uh, building after war. I come from Syria, a place you may have uh, been hearing the bad news for far too long now. The war has been raging in my country for almost seven years, during which we experienced all kinds of atrocities from destruction, killing, shelling to kidnap, mortars, power and water cuts, you name it. The good news, sorry, <laughs> the good news is that we've survived, but sadly not entirely. My city Homs, for example, this is the map of Homs shows you the level of destruction. The severity, according to color, 60% uh, of the city is destroyed. And uh, in real life, this diagram will translate as such and such and so on. Now, the conflict has uh, passed over to the farther surrounding areas. We are left with 100,000 housing units marked as inhabitable and the uh, devastated city center. However, the, with the retreat of battling, the talks of reconstruction are restarting, and the preparation for the new business is undergoing, but aside from signing contracts, no serious action on ground has been taken. Uh, whether it's international organizations or government or private sectors, all, all the parties are uh, preparing for their businesses, but no one is asking what we are asking today. How to rebuild cities after war. They are asking how to maximize profit, how to reward winners, how to attract uh, funding and so on. But no one is asking how to actually rebuild. From my view, the real rebuilding means an act of healing, not just patching or erecting. However, Syrian cities before the war have followed a pattern of destruction of self-destruction, really, that, demonst uh, that demonstrated itself in two main areas, the informalities and the property investment. Informalities 
are basically slums built in inf uh, informally and illegally outside of the regulatory uh, plan of the city, mostly inhabited through internal uh, immigration, mainly from the rural to urban areas and partly by the Palestinian camps. They were segregated according to social class uh, and uh, creed, origin, all, all of them mentioned. And they made up 40% of the total 23 million Syrian population before the war. Uh, the informalities were built as bare blocks with poorly installed infrastructure, but people still preferred them to the government social housing projects, which were standing empty in the middle no of nowhere. Investing in the property market, on the other hand, is closely related to the vexed pro problem of the informalities. But uh, as it is, uh, because as what was called as the, the property mafia had monopolized the property market by excessive purchases and tailored building re re regulation, regulations, sorry, all enabled by widespread corruption in both public and private sector. I'll elaborate on the dynamics of this, how this led to the conflict in Syria in my book, The Battle for Home. Uh, but what, what relates to the topic we are discussing today is that rebuilding after war have to uh, deal with the problem of the before the war. Informalities are the easy prey for investment because of the flo uh, floating property status and because uh, they are interesting, interestingly because they compose most of the destroyed areas in this war. In 2016, my city was still under shelling. I used to hear the crumble of each building falling hit by hit from my window. It was also the time I entered a UN Habitat competition for the rehabilitation of mass housing around the world. My proposal won first place on national level, but it wasn't because it was a design for rehabilitation, rather for rebuilding. At the time, a locality called Baba Amr was making its daily appearances on the international news for, because it was the first area in Syria where, uh, where violence erupted, changing the course of demonstrations and crackdown tensions into a violent civil war. Shortly after, the locality came, came out totally destroyed evacuated and shut down. My design relied on a study I did for the history and social makeup of the area and the economic means and activity available there. As an informality itself, there have been many considerations to be taken into account, including main, uh, main infrastructure lines of the city. In this map, you can see the, the layout of the area before and how, uh, how there are main constraints of infrastructure, as said, and the mixed property status between private, public, and shared. According to uh, the property status, the heights of the buildings were varied. Taking these main factors in consideration, in addition to the agricultural uh, nature of surrounding farms, uh, the side and the plan uh, network was determined. But before I explain the plan, I must note that the economic activity in this locality depended on two, two main uh, means, agriculture and craftsmanship. Yet people and their lifestyles cannot be completely considered as neither rural uh, nor urban. The history and the creation of the local locality is very interesting. I dedicate a complete chapter for it in, in the book because of, of its role in the conflict. But uh, I was fortunate enough to have access to these close-up insights that enabled me to look at the design from a user's perspective because my husband is originally from Baba Amr and my in-laws were living until the last very days of the locality. I come from, I come from different background, so even as a citizen of the same city, this kind of life wasn't fully graspable, none for this coincidence. But so is the case of most of the people who designed the so-called so social mass housing in projects in Syria. That's why they all look exactly the same and uh, equally dreadful. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I should, this, is, this is an example of the social housing of the government. The design, uh, uh, the, take a look now at the gov what the government has issued for, uh, for Baba Amr, to rebuilding Baba Amr after destruction. This design, if we can call it this way, was issued in the same year, 2014, instantly after destruction. 
It is the only project that came out uh, for an area destroyed by the air, about, by the war, for the public eye. And obviously it was a declaration of the kind of future awaiting for those informalities after the war. They are the next forms for investment, and they will be the labs for new demographical uh, composition while they dedicate a new, uh, new terms of isolation. In my proposal, I would like to think I had a different vision. I try to avoid the problems of the past situation while keeping it relevant to the uh, lifestyle and traditions. Uh, the tree unit is made up of a cluster of courtyard houses where privacy and, uh, privacy and nature are the main focus. All courtyards should be open and protected at the same time from vo uh, being viewed by the others. Uh, including neighboring windows. The task was to reach this goal while maintaining the traditional setup of the apartments and to create an urban unit that can unfold in four directions and connect to the uh, mirrored units around. Namely, to extend the architectural cluster, the, the tree unit, into an urban cluster through connecting the unfold unfolding surrounding units. This, in this way, the quality of growth was established uh, so it is not literal reference to the tree, as you may first imagine, rather the quality of what trees do, i.e. growing. It can grow horizontally in urban sense, and it can grow vertically in architectural sense. That's how you can spot the conceptual difference between this design and the design of Moshe Safari's Habitat 67 in Montreal. Some people made the connection by comparing these two shots. I have to admit that they look uh, may appear very similar but i see no real connections sp specifically because the two spring from totally different concepts and understanding and more essentially they reach different outcomes in creation adaptation and design logic and organization my design is built on a unit able to grow not randomly or accumulatively rather intertwined geometrically and rooted in traditional cu culture the real resemblance I tried to make was, however, to the street bridge, which can be found in old Islamic cities in Syria. I've been always fascinated by this structure and what an impact it can make on street view, shade and light, and weather protection, as well as the design fluidity and f flexibility in making place within the apartment. This was applicable in the tree unit. When the apartments in the neighboring units can exchange room spaces according to determined apartment size. I believe the important, importance of drawing lessons from old city, uh, but not in a nostalgic way, nor in mere copy and paste approach as we in many, pro in many projects that try to make reference to the, the region's culture do. So why else? Let me explain very quickly first what was successful in old cities. Unlike the project of social and mass housing in old cities in Syria, they were they were hives for mixed-use functions, local production-based economy, and combined with encounter-based trade. <laughs> they were places where multi multiple functions were considered and interwoven, uh, where ba different backgrounds and social classes intertwined within, uh, within and around uh, will, uh, all will considered sense of scale, proportion, and details, built with sustainable and resilient building materials, and achieving high standards of what we call today passive design, techniques or green design, green design. but for, for them it was simply common sense. Most of these descriptions may apply to many of the world's old heritage locations, but I believe what was unique in the case of the Syrian cities is their layering approach. They so brilliantly carried out uh, this approach in the way they used to uh, use other uh, <coughs> civilization's elements or structures or even techniques within their new outcome. Most of what you see remaining in the old cities in Syria belong to the Ottoman era, some to the Mamluk and some to the Ayyubid Islamic styles. But amazingly, you will find elements which will belong back to the Hellenistic and Roman eras thousands of years back, incorporated within these very structures. They were the embodiment of what the term urban fabric means an act of interweaving people as well as stone. In this sense, the sense of uh, incorporation and blending with harmony extended to the details of the life of those urban settlements. People have picked up that and uh, in their own relationships, architecture was able to create terms of, for the city life. 
namely a place for people, nature and economic activity to thrive, not mere boxes capable only of encapsulation. Uh, the images I will show you of the old city of Homs may not strike you with their beauty, not because they are half destroyed, as I think you may still be able to identify their appeal despite destruction, but because they stand in humbleness. They were built in black basalt of uh, our uh, local volcanic stone. They, adopt, they also adopted the Sufi principles, which engulfed the city for both Muslims and Christians in a Lutheran kind of austerity. These buildings, these buildings stood for what mattered to people and expressed what they believed in, not by imposing, nor by ostentation, but by their beauty and efficiency. They gained the power to inspire. Hence, what I dream for our cities after war is to pick up some of what has ex uh, existed among people for such a long time and pr proved all along that it was good and of good of and use. Not necessarily the exact, exact example of Sufism, this is not the point, but something that can equally inspire and be of worth. In Syria, we have a proverb that says, uh, that's who, that who doesn't have an old, old doesn't have a new. <coughs> To live in a new world doesn't mean to readily, readily accept every self-proving prophecy and narrative businessmen and policy makers have to present to us. For example, we don't have to fully embrace their new brand of smart cities where they will be selling their fourth industrial revolution. We fell for this before with cars and now we are negotiating what we should have done right from the beginning at the time to create more walkable uh, sociable and sustainable places. I believe architects can find the required middle ground. They can uh, consider what to pick up and what to challenge. They can choose when to look back and when to look forward and what to keep and what to reinvent. Because with, do, with all due respect, any idiot can demolish and start over, but only the skilled can make sense of what already exists. Thank you. So before I begin, actually, I think it's really useful. Uh, my presentation you'll find to be dramatically different than the two you've just heard. Uh, and so I think it's useful to try to connect the three of us. Uh, one, to acknowledge Anti-Slavery Day uh, and to understand warfare in Syria by comparison to what I'm going to talk about, about future cities from the U.S. perspective. It's not as if we do not have exploited peoples in the United States, and it's not as if we do not have violence in our streets. But I am talking to you about where it is local leaders, city mayors, city councilors, city managers, are trying to take all of those challenges and move something forward in a really dramatic way. Uh, it'll be based on the research that I've done at the National League of Cities, and it is, I think, the, the transformative element of how we get to the future that we want based on the work at the local level with people like local governments here in the US. I'm going to give you five major themes where we have done some work. Uh, those themes are the interconnected city, the Internet of Things. They are the uh, technology and mobility connections. They are sustainability, they are the future of work, and also reforms in criminal justice, particularly youth criminal justice. So the first piece, the Internet of Things, the connected city. Uh, we know, obviously, that the technology in cities is driving a huge bit of dynamism uh, around city planning, uh, technology, infrastructure, energy, data collection, uh, autonomous vehicles that we're seeing already on our city streets, the data they collected, the interconnections they have with the communications network. We're creating a place where Cities are less and less about cars and more and more about people and about how people move about. We're, we're looking at the way these interconnections help us to do the things we want, such as uh, the work of Link NYC in New York City as hotspots at scale so that we're doing something about how people access the digital world in a place, particularly in the United States, where there is this digital divide. 
those that have access to these networks, and those who don't. Similarly, the work of uh, shared vehicles. Right? Again, more and more people using shared vehicles, which allows us to free up space with roadways, with things like parking lots and parking garages. I mean, imagine the notion of autonomous vehicles who are ultimately help making street lights and traffic a thing of the past because of the knowledge and the sharing and the connections between traffic signals and vehicles and uh, allowing you to move somewhat more seamlessly through the city. Also, environmental issues. Smart meters, smart water, smart electricity, smart gas, helping us to integrate the management of energy into our cities. You see in this graphic, solar panels, wind turbines, helping make uh, a more environmentally friendly city. And of course, uh, a city that might be safer. In the US, we have gunshots quite regularly. Uh, you can put sensors in streetlights that tell you where gunshots are coming from. And you can set situations where the streetlights will flash to help alert emergency first responders to the emergency situation they want to come from. Moving to the second piece, transportation and technology and the whole mobility piece. In the research we did at National League of Cities, we looked at the city transportation plans, scores of them. City transportation plans speak 10 and sometimes 20 years out. And of course, the first thing we discovered is that cities and their city planners are looking at the number one problem 20 years from now, which is traffic congestion. Right? So they've built solutions about roadways and cars when anybody <laughs> knows that the future is not about traffic congestion, the future is about multimodal and moving seamlessly from <coughs> one point to another as you move around the city from your home to your place of work uh, to whatever recreation opportunities you want. We know that seamlessness of transportation is the goal and the, the innovative cities are building streetcar networks and rail lines and integrated bicycle networks and tying all things together. Regionally, this is important because in places like San Francisco and Seattle, they're using a regional perspective and they're issuing a single card. It's called the Clipper card in San Francisco, the Orca card in Seattle. It allows you to access the transportation system of the entire region with a single payment card. So linking those payment systems is really very useful. Um, now, going from technology to people, right? Because obviously we know that as technology advances, artificial intelligence, robotics, it's going to affect the way we work. And we've been looking a great deal at the future of work and what jobs people will do. Uh, we know that <gasps> service sector jobs, we know that automation is driving a different dynamic between labor and capital. And we know that the skills required are changing dramatically. And so, for example, in the US, 9.5 million jobs uh, in the industry of trucking and drivers, right? This is a job mostly for men, for example, and a third of them are driving trucks. Well, the data that we've looked at will say that between 10 and 20 percent of all the cars on the road by 2025 worldwide will be autonomous vehicles. What are we going to do with those millions of people who are driving trucks? What kind of skills do they need to have to meet the new demand of the new environment where automation and technology is driving the work they need to do? This is not just affecting mobility and roadways. Clerical work, customer service, sales, education, healthcare, science and engineering, information technology, finance, legal sectors are all being driven by technology, by automation, by robotics. We're seeing increases in productivity, but we're leaving an entire sector of people behind in terms of the job skills they need. And so the question for us really is, will we have the capable human workforce to keep up with the technology that we need in order to do this work? going to move to sustainability and resilience. Now, I could talk about a whole bunch of cities around sustainability and resilience. This is one, West Palm Beach. The reason I use it is because uh, Mayor Moyo, port, port there in the middle with some of my colleagues at the National League of Cities, uh, West Palm Beach has achieved a four-star rating in what we call the Star Community Index. It's a measure in the U.S. of local sustainability efforts. It looks at all of the different factors, environmental, economic, uh, social implications for 
all of sustainability and here in West Palm Beach they've gone out looking at disaster preparedness at a resilient urban future. It's all on display. Um, the city is doing energy consumption reduction for public facilities. They're doing increasing growth of local farm products to do sustainable food systems for the community and they're trying to ensure that recreational space, city parks, are available to everyone within about half a mile of their location. Greenhouse gas emissions, equitable development, data collection, mobility, and increasing economic opportunity for all, so that equity agenda is all part of what they're doing in West Palm Beach. And they've attracted a lot of attention. We have a partnership with them where we're actually helping to support sustainability and philanthropies like Bloomberg and uh, the Knight Foundation have all come to be part of that. Last issue, uh, policing, juvenile justice, justice reform, particularly important juvenile justice. Uh, the goal is zero juvenile detentions in juvenile detention centers, right? We want to keep young people out of the criminal justice system. We know from the evidence that says if, if young people are arrested early for low-level crimes, right, skipping school, running away from home, alcohol use, that their lifetime behaviors and outcomes are changed. So the goal is keep them out of the criminal justice system. And so I'll offer you three examples, right? Peoria, Illinois. Police officers in Peoria, Illinois, uh, when confronted with a domestic violence situation where family members are fighting with each other, used to just arrest everybody. Uh, uh, now, rather than doing that, they're looking at the root causes, right? They're looking at a public health approach to public safety, not a criminal justice approach. And so when a teenager is stepping between his mother and his father who are engaged in a fist fight, what you need is to figure out what are the root problems of that family, not arrest the young people for throwing punches in and around uh, their, their families. Uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. When Lake Charles, Louisiana police officers confront young people who might be involved in these low-level issues of uh, criminality. They used to take them to the juvenile detention center. Now they take them to a multi-resource agency where they might actually be able to get the thing they need, like a meal or a tutor or a counselor to help them understand what their problem is. And in Tucson, Arizona, the police officers, the juvenile probation officers have worked to create a protocol, a pathway for work that says when an officer confronts a young person, let's actually ascertain if they are at risk or not. Do they have a criminal record? Uh, are they missing from their home? Are they involved in gangs? Have they been in trouble with the law before? If they are, well, fine. You could arrest them, take them into custody. But they're, if they're not, let's move them to a different pathway, diverting them, looking at the social indicators of health, and not looking at the criminal justice system. I started out with the important piece, what's the hopeful element of this? It's simply that cities will lead the way. Cities and city leaders are the ones who are problem solving. In the United States, they are the heart of decision makers and problem solvers. While the national government is wholly dysfunctional, it is the local government leaders who are sitting, who are working together, who are solving problems, who are confronting change, who are being innovative. And that's where I see the hope, and that's the world I've gotten to live in for a long time working with city leaders. It's why I'm delighted to be here in Bristol. It's what I've seen here, and I'm delighted to be able to spend the time for the next several days to be part of this event. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome, sir. And um, so Gil Penaloza has stolen my mic, so I'm coming up here now. Um, so he can walk around. I met uh, Gil in Montreal when we were both speaking at Metropolis, which is a organization for cities over a million. We're a little city of half that amount but uh, uh, maybe we have lessons both to learn and to, to give to others. But Gil is uh, the founder and uh, chair of 880, which is an organization that he will, pro he, that he will explain. And uh, he was transformational in terms of what he did with the parks and play facilities uh, in Bogota, which has been one of my shining examples. It's one of the places that I stole ideas from. And I always say there are very few original ideas. All my ideas are recycled, and many of them from the Penalosas. Over to Gil. Thank you.
Thank you. While this comes up, uh, it's so nice to be here. What a wonderful presentation this morning. Each one so different from each other. Um, don't start counting the time yet. <laughs> <laughs> no? I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, really great to be here the, the, the next three days because there are so many things happening at the Festival of Ideas from all over the world and through all kinds, presentations, movies, talks, theater. This morning I want to talk about cities and we know that we are going through so many issues uh, with our climate change. The population is growing. We are living longer, much longer. We have urban growth. We got a public health crisis. Uh, mental, physical, emotional. So there is, we need to develop a sense of urgency in so many ways. And population in cities, let's think about it. Today we got about 3.5 billion people living in cities. In 40 years, within the lifetime of our children, within the lifetime of people at the universities today, we're going to go to 7.2 billion. So not only do we have to improve the cities that we have today, but we got to create great cities for this 3.7 billion additional. So that's what I want to talk about, the, the magnificent opportunity that we have. I run two organizations, 880 Cities. These are the websites. Both are non-profits, so you can find videos and documents, World Urban Parks. And I've been lucky to have worked in over 250 different cities. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Bogota. Obviously, Bogota is not the ideal city is decades behind Bristol. But I, when I was commissioner, I learned that it's not about the money. Always, you go to cities and we're oh, we don't have the, it's not about the money. Also, I've been doing, now I advise many cities, but before I was doing, in the first term, we built over 200 parks, all over the city, and then the next one, over 600, small ones, big ones, in the corners. This was one of them. The Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and then he left, and nothing happened. Nothing happened, not even sidewalks, in almost 27 years. Why nothing happened? Because change is hard. Change is hard in Bristol, or in Bogota, or in New York, or in Copenhagen, or Mumbai, everywhere. Because when you try to change, and we just saw what's happening in Syria, the cave people show up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The city sense yes, against virtually everything. <laughs> <laughs> but then, all of us got to become champions a changing. You know, this is how it turned out. After three years, we turned it into one of the nicest parks for passive, for active, for contemplative recreation. We gotta become champions at finding solutions to the problems, not at finding problems to the solutions. We gotta find that little crack through the window and run through it. And do the change, do the cities as good as we can make them. And the waterways, you have you hear this magnificent river and all of the transformation that happened where you got the uh, water. And it's not just about big parks, we gotta make small parks. This is some of the poorest areas. We did hundreds of these parks in the smallest and the poorest areas of the city. And it, in many ways, it transforms cities. And something else that we did is Ciclovia, which in North America we call it open streets. It's a simple concept. It'd be, we had a few miles, a few thousand people, and we turned it into the world's largest pop up park. What is it? Sunday morning, we pop it up. And people come out to walk, to bike, to skate. How do you do it? It's simple. We open streets to people, we close into cars, and magic happens. You get young. You know, we did 75 miles. Why? Because the, all of these are the income levels, and in developing countries, very stratified. So I wanted to make sure that the wealthiest areas of the city would be connected to the poorest, so everybody would be mixed, and also how to interconnect all of the major parks, so that we use the streets not as an end, but also as a means to get to places and get to see their own city. I enjoy people, but not everybody wanted to walk or bike or skate, so along the road we do aerobics, we do tai chi, we use the cha-cha-cha. <laughs> Anything that you want, but everything is about physical activity. 
who comes? Everybody. All you need is two feet and a heartbeat, and you're going to be there. And you're going to enjoy it. Young, old, rich, poor, fat, skinny. We get over 1.7 million every Sunday of the year. Plus holidays, so about 65 days. But the most important thing is that it changes minds. It changes minds. All of a sudden, we realize that the streets are public space. They belong to all of us. One third of the city are streets. They cannot be just to move cars 24-7. <coughs> it can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. It has become like a positive virus that even cities like Los Angeles, the city of angels and cars, now they're doing their ciclavia. And it works in cities of 10,000, of 100,000, 10 million, 20 million like Mexico City, New York, poor countries, rich countries, anywhere. For the people on wheelchairs, it's kind of heaven. All of a sudden, you got all of this space and no one, no danger at all. It is about social integration, how to connect. Paris, Paris used to have the Paris Plage. One month of the year, they would go crazy from the middle of July to the middle of August. And they say, well, if it works so well one, week, one month of the year, why don't we do it all year? And then now it turns into Paris Respire. And now they're doing it all year along the Seine River. The great thing about this is that we meet each other as equals. My inspiration was Olmsted, who did Central Park in New York 107 years ago. And he said in New York, everybody hated everybody. Locals and immigrants, blacks and whites, rich. And, he said we need places where we can meet each other as equals. And I think this is a way for any city of any size to have people meeting each other as equals. Like rebuilding cities, something like this could be great. And then when my brother was mayor the first time, 276 miles of protected byways in three years. And went from a few thousand to half a million people cycling all over the places, and piggybacking, getting any rainwater drainage and making it protect a, 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 bus rapid traffic, a bus rapid transit system. And in the pipeways, creating a network. Some of these places are so poor that it's almost impossible to imagine in beautiful Bristol the level of poverty in most of these places. But how this can be transformed with good quality sidewalks and bikeways and why good quality sidewalks? And part of it is because it's going to be safer. But just as important is because we need to dignify. We need to dignify the pedestrian. We need to dignify the cyclists, putting the right plans for the, according to the microclimate within the city and putting lights and so on. But let's pass away from Bogota for a while. In the next 40 years, we're saying we're going to grow by 3.7 billion. So if that's going to happen in the next 40, let's see what have we done in the last 40. Because if the way we've been doing cities is good, okay, let's just do more of the same. You know, when I was a teenager, I was in Vancouver at UN Habitat. And that was when Habitat was created. I was there just by coincidence because our father was the under Secretary General of the UN. He was Secretary General of Habitat in charge of it. There was another Trudeau as Prime Minister in Canada. And my concern is that many of the same issues that I heard as a teenager are happening today. This is how we've been building cities in the last 40 years. When we allow just supply and demand and no government intervention, this is how we, how we end up doing cities. We keep sending the poorest people to the further, furthest away places, the worst places to urbanize, to bring jobs and water and sewage. You know, today we still have a billion people in, in, in the world without clean water. One out of three people in the world don't have sewage and sanitation. And this is some of the things that we try to do. Even in the wealthiest country in the world, in the U.S., you go to some places of the city I was working in Cleveland, I went to this part, the life is pretty 64. Ten minutes away, it's 90. And it's not because it's Cleveland, you go to Washington, you go to my, uh, New Orleans, you go to almost any city. In the wealthiest country in the world, it doesn't make any sense. And what worries me more is not only that this happened, but that people have assumed that this is normal. They say, oh, 50, it's because they drink too much beer. What? These places don't even have a place to buy fruits and vegetables even if they wanted to. They don't have a grocery store. Instead, they got four times as many convenience stores. They don't have parks, or if they have one, that totally destroyed the quality of the schools. This is how we've been growing. Mexico, Mexico, the largest 90 cities in Mexico, in the last 30 years, they grew by two and a half times. 
population. That's not good or bad if you do it right. But while the population grew two and a half times, the footprint grew 11 times. How are you going to bring jobs and water and sewage and education, mobility, if you are growing by 11 times in 30 years? Land use and mobility are two sides of the same coin. And what have we done in mobility in the last 40 years? We've been just focusing on car, 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 car. Not on people's happiness. And this is the kind of cities that we've been building. Totally horrible. So is this what we're going to do in the next 40? And the countries whose economy are coming up, such as China and Russia, this is the kind of thing they're doing. In India, in India, less than 10% of the households have cars. However, they're spending all of their money building elevated highways. It is even ethical that the World Bank and all these financial institutions are lending money for this to the, when the developed countries are tearing down elevated highways, this, they're funding elevated highways when they know that it does not work. There is no city in the world that has all the issue of mobility through the private car, none. And all have tried in the last 80 years. If that was a solution, we would have hundreds of examples. In India, they're building elevated highways so fast that they even fall down before they're finished. <laughs> so whatever we have done in the last 40 is clearly not a good idea to do more of the same in the next 40. So what we have, and I love this festival, is that we have a fantastic opportunity, but also a wonder, an enormous responsibility. Look, the population has not grown in general. For hundreds of thousands of years, it wasn't growing. What happened? All of a sudden we got clean water in most places, and sewage, and vaccination, and then the population grew. Because people were having 8, 10, 12 children. And 10 children, 9 of them would die, 8 of them would die. But now they started to survive. So for a while, it started to grow. The good thing is that this is the rate of growth. It peaked around 1980. Now it's going very, very low. So this growth is going to go only to around 2050, 2060 and the population is going to level off around 9.5 billion. The urban population is going to level off around 7.2, 7.5 billion. So in the next 40 years, this has never happened before, it will never happen again probably. We're going to double the population living in cities. And the cities are not really responsible for the what. That's more at the national levels. But the cities are responsible for the how. Is this what we're going to be building? All of the sudden children, all older adults, handicapped people, become kind of slaves to someone that has a car, even just to go out for an ice cream. And most of this is what we're doing today in most of the cities in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in the growth in some places in Europe, and in all the developing countries. So it's not just an issue of developing countries. It's something that we are still doing a lot of this. How do we want to live? I'm hopeful when I see some examples. Barcelona is a very walkable city. And they, but they're good. If you're good, you want to be even better. That's a symptom. They're already very walkable. They said, oh, we want to improve walking. Not 5%, 10%, 66%. They got all of this wonderful grid that we saw here. So there, the grid was mixed, walking, cycling, transit. They said, no, now, this was six months ago. Now, as of now, we're going to have one, mix everything, and then walk in, walk in. Everything, walk in, walk in. Fantastic. Some uh, multi-blocks. And it's going to be, it's, it's going to continue making this city great. By cycling. Copenhagen. I love to talk about Copenhagen because sometimes when I go to cities across North America or in developing countries, they say, oh, cycling, that's the thing of the past. No, cycling. This country has a higher per capita income almost than any city in North America. It, level of education. However, they bike in the summer, in the winter, in the rain. It rains all year round. 41 out of 100 trips are done on bikes. <coughs> in the center, more than 60%. But they have fantastic infrastructure. And they continue to improve. And there are 41, and they're saying, now we want to go to 50. And you don't even need shirts for, to go to 50 or special shoes to ride your bike. <laughs> it's having the combination of the pedestrians, the cyclists, the public transit, total combination and the seamless that Jim was talking about. We, I see also we're starting to put nature in so many places. And that is good because all of the health benefits of having nature. So it's exciting 
how we're seeing in many places. You know, Argentina is a, a city of cars, cars, cars. Well, look at this. They had these 16 lanes for cars. And a gutsy mayor said, okay, we're going to take four line, for the four lanes out and create a bus rapid transit. And by the way, he was elected president last year. It's President Macri. They didn't have any BRTs, and now they got aid. Toronto, it was growing so much that we got like 18 municipalities. The provincial government put a green belt. No one got, we are going to grow by 50% in the next 25 years. 50%, huge growth. This area has about 5 million people. We're going to go to 7.5. Say, so, no, we got to grow within this boundary. I've also seen a lot of cars, roads, are being turned into parks, so it's exciting. You know, there used to be a river going through here, and 40, 50 years ago it was efficiency, 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 so they built a road on top of the river. This is really important because today we live in an ever more globalized world. And in a globalized world, the best people can live anywhere. However you define best, can be the medical doctors, pizza makers, community organizers. If I'm a good carpenter, I can live anywhere. So where am I going to live? Wherever I have quality of life. It's not GDP, it's quality of life. These people said, can we go to Bristol and get some of the best people to come here? Probably not. So eight years ago, someone said, wasn't there a river going down? And they brought it out. So you want to live here or you want to live here? That's the idea. Are we going to, you know, this is Seoul. South Korea had this eight miles through the middle of the core. They had one, one floor, got full. They built a second floor, got full. So they wanted a third floor. And the mayor said, eight miles through the middle of the city, the mayor said, no, no third row, fourth floor. He brought out the river. He created a linear park of eight miles right through the heart of the city and put public transit. It's so nice what they have done. And we see it in Portland, how it was transformed. And we see it now in Madrid. So there's some examples of things that are happening. Now the mayor of Paris just announced that she's going to make a linear park permanent here where there was a highway. So all of you might say, okay, let's relax because we are doing. No, we got to do more and we got to do it faster. Unfortunately, this example that we are seeing, a lot of these are exceptions. Most of the cities are, are, not, are, are not doing, they are talking. Talking is good, because a lot of these things, 20 years ago, we were not even talking. So it's good that we are talking about these type of things. But we got to move from talking to doing, because we are not doing. And we also got to do things right. But we also got to do the right things, not only do things right. One, one, one way to do it, we suggest is, let's make 880 cities. What's 880 cities? Well, 880 is not about parks or streets or walking or cycling. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we contribute to make some vibrant cities. You know, this is a really good example for what you are doing. Malmo, 20 years ago, they lost, or 30 years ago, they lost 50% of the jobs in two years because it was totally industrial. It was shipyards, and they left, and they had to reinvent. And when they created here, they needed to do thousands and thousands of houses, and they said, how are we going to do it? Part of it is they did not allow any architect to do more than four, to design more than four. So that they said, we need this, we don't want this to look like Walt Disney. That all of them, that. No, we need this to look like if it had been done over 50 years, except that we're going to do it in five. And it was magnificent. But more about what, some of the things that are vibrant cities. You know, I was speaking in Warsaw, and the day before I went to this place where I was going to speak, and I see all of these people dancing, and I said, oh, how am I going to compete against this? <laughs> And then I see the DJ, DJ Vika. <laughs> We're living longer. This is exciting. She's a businesswoman. She's an entrepreneur. Does all the music, set up the equipment, does it, lives. So it's about vibrant cities and healthy communities for people of all ages. And when I'm in any city, always people come up and say, oh, Gil, can my children, is this intersection safe? Can my children walk it? Can my children walk to school? Can my great-grandparents bike to get eggs or milk? Look, you don't need to be an engineer. Three simple steps. We call it the eighty rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. <laughs> Step number one, think of a child that you love. Anyone, someone around eight years old. Your son, your daughter, your grandchild. Once you have that child in mind, step number two, think of an 80-year-old that you also love. Your parents, your grandparents. Jimmy Carter building houses in Canada a few months ago. And when you have that eight and that 80 or around that, the child and the other in your mind, 
Then step number three, would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to the park to take public transit? Would they feel safe? If you worry it's because it's safe enough, if you would notice because it's not, and we gotta do it better. What if everything that we did in Bristol, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the school, the library, the convention center, the bridge, everything had to be good for an 8 and an 80. Not 8 to 80, 8 and 80, because if it's good for the 8 and 80, they're like kind of like indicator species. If it's good for the 8 and the 80, it's going to be good for everybody, from 0 to over 100. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30-year-old and athletic. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to build great cities for all. That's the concept. So I just want to ask all of you, we got to become guardian angels, guardian angels of the gentle majority. What do we mean by gentle majority? The children, the older adults, the poor. By gentle is that they're not the squeaky wheel. You do the public meetings, the children are doing homework or sleeping, the poor people have two and three jobs, so they don't go to, but we need to keep them in mind. When we are talking about cities for a new world, when we evaluate cities, we should evaluate by how do we treat the most vulnerable people. The children, the older adults, the poor. Let me give you an example of them. The children. We have not been good to children. And it's not just in developing countries. Everywhere. Look, these are the wealthiest countries in the world. The share of children living in poverty. One out of five kids in the U.S. And then in the U.K. you say, oh, we're so great because we got only one out of ten. Well, South Korea is one out of fifteen. Denmark is one out of thirty-seven. So we can do much better. And these are the wealthiest country in the world. In Bristol, we gotta have playability everywhere. Play has to be something critical everywhere. I'm attending an, an, an event this Friday about this. You are walking on the sidewalks and you can have a swing. You are waiting for public transit and you got a parklet. Play is so important. And it's not about money. Sometimes it's just a little bit of creativity. You have creativity and you, you make your city fun, playable for everybody. And some say, oh yeah, playing is good because it's fun and games. No, it's not only fun and games, it's how children learn. Playing is how children develop their, their, their strength in their muscles, their cognitive thinking, their capacity to socialize, develop friendships. They develop a sense of belonging. Even a Nobel Prize in economy is saying the best return on investment is prenatal and zero to three, and then four to five. The children playing, they develop a sense of belonging to the neighborhood, to the city to the world, to the human race. So maybe in Bristol and everywhere, we should have a goal that every child should have a park or a play area within walking distance, within a 10 minute walk. Now, in four years, I totally do. Older adults, we are living longer. Not longer, much, much longer. You know, the people that have ever lived to 65 in the history of humanity, half are alive today. Half are alive today. And we're gonna double the people over 65 and quadruple the people over 80. And it's so exciting. You know, people are not thinking about retirement, they're thinking about retirement. Maybe we should create a movement, the 60 plus alive. The biggest waste of resource in the world are the older adults. People retire and we cross them out as if they had died. Except that they got 20, 30, 40 years. They are healthier and wealthier and more active and more knowledgeable. They could be teaching English to the refugees. They could be tutoring kids in the schools. They could be organizing activities in the park, Tai Chi and yoga and walking groups. The university should be taking up. All their, all their adults are hungry to learn about all kinds of activities, science and music and history. This is new. Just 200 years ago, this is the life expectancy. These are all the countries in the world. 200 years ago, we didn't have one country with a life expectancy above 45. Today, we don't have any with life expectancy below 45. In the UK, we have been born in the UK 150 years ago. The life expectancy was 40. Many of us would be dead by now. Now, though, we have more than double the life expectancy. It's clear we have learned how to survive. But when we have all of these issues, it's also clear we got to learn how to live. And this festival of cities is about that. It's about collectively learning how to live. What is the role of all of us throughout these days? Think about what does it mean, how to live? What does sustainable happiness mean around the well-being of the individual as long as it doesn't affect the environment and the future and others? And then the poor. I'm talking about equity, not equality. You know, these eight guys have more money, more wealth than half of the world. 
Imagine the capacity to influence media and politicians and so on. The other saw a cartoon that explained the difference of equity and equality pretty good. This is equality. No, some people are starting so far behind that some might need two and three boxes while others might not need any box. So it's very different. From the point of view of mobility, you know, the people that have cars, we force people to have cars, are spending 25, one out of four pounds of their income on mobility. And if they are low income, they're to 40%. When they could be spending only 5% if they walked and bike and use public transit, there is nothing a government can do that would improve the personal income of people than allowing households to downsize from two cars to one or one to zero. And that's also great for the economy because instead of being spent, if, instead of spending $10,000 a year on mobility, you're going to spend that in your garden, in your house. So all of this is how do we want to live? So. Eight messages is, one is become a guardian angel. Two, let's take advantage of this magnificent opportunity. Three, we can have great parks, but not just one iconic park. We need a park system with the neighborhood park, the middle one, the big ones, because they satisfy different needs. The neighborhood park is where we develop communities, where we meet our friends, the neighbors. We develop solidarity. Four, we need sustainable mobility. We need cities walking. You know, every less than two minutes, a person driving a car kills a person walking. That is horrible. That's like five planes full of people every day. And we, this is not a technical issue. We can avoid it. Sweden created Vision Zero and implemented, and Sweden went way down. We can learn from each other. Five, the side with the bikeways are important. All of a sudden, your park breaks down, you go to the city, and they say, oh, do fundraising. But when you go to the city and say, oh, there is a pothole, they fix the pothole. Why do we need to do fundraising to fix the playground, but the city takes care of the potholes? Everybody learns from everybody. We can learn from Malmo, how it was redone. We can learn from Bristol, so many other things. Same, the community, yes, honestly listen to the community. It cannot be just tokenism so that when we go to council, did you go to the community? Yes, check, no. The community are going to come with great ideas. And last, let's focus on the benefits. When we're talking about any of these things and we're talking to the community or to the non-converted, don't talk about parks, don't talk about ability. Talk about environment, economic activity, recreation, transportation, health. Just one example, because we're going to have for all of them. Health. Public health, is this what the future looks like? The issue of obesity is not just how people look, but it's heart attack, respiratory problem, depression, anxiety. And then you say, oh, but the U.S. is one out of three and the U.K. were not as bad. Well, again, the wealthiest country in the world and the U.K. is 31st. Certainly can do a lot better. And, of course, there is nothing as good as doing, being active as a normal part of everyday life. In the sidewalks, in the parks, in the streets, and that is going to be good for physical health. But there is no health without mental health. Depression today is the leading cause of disability. <laughs> And we know that if we have contact with the nature, it's going to improve the mood, the cognitive attention. If our neighbors, if our neighbors are green, we're going to have lower depression and anxiety and stress. So the trees is not just because it looks nice. It's because they have so many other benefits to the environment and to health. And this is just about how do we want to live. So I want to end by saying, let's think outside the box. These are not technical issues. The solutions exist. This is not financial. The money also exists. It is political. Political. With a big P, everybody has to participate. We need to create broad alliances. We gotta get engaged the elected officials at the city, at the national level. We gotta get the public sector, but not just the planners. Education, public health, economic development. And we gotta get the community. It's like a three-legged stool. How do we try this three-legged stool? Through developing a sense of urgency and a shared vision of how we wanna live. And cities for a new world it's really about creating vibrant cities and healthy communities where all people are going to live happier. I wish you much success. Thank you very much. Very close to my heart. And uh, I think you can probably see where some of, those, uh, some of those ideas that I came up with came from. And uh, now we're going to have discussion with all four of the speakers. Uh, you will be seeing some of the speakers uh, later if you, uh, if, if, if you want. Uh, 2.30, there will be um, a ja Jaime Lerner from, uh, from Curitiba in, in Brazil, who is a 
great master of cities, Gil will agree with me. He's somebody who just does it. And uh, so, uh, and I think Marwa will be at that session. Uh, Jim? I don't, tomorrow. Jim will be tomorrow. Gil will be at the session on children, quite appropriately, on Friday. So many opportunities. But now if I could ask you to get into the uh, seats here. Uh. Thank you. So Antonio Sampaio from the IISS at Think Tank. Um, my question uh, goes to you and to Marwa. Um, so we talk a lot about social integration as being a uh, tool for, for, for creating safer cities, more prosperous cities. Um, so both Bogota and, and, and homes and Syrian cities in general face several security issues and uh, very different ones. But in Syria after the war, um, obviously it doesn't mean that um, security and conflict will end. We see that um, the problem of militias and gangs in, in, in Middle Eastern cities and ethnic and sectarian divisions, and in Bogota the problem of gangs. Um, so in practice, in your views, how to use urbanism um, and spaces and the sort of connections that you talked about, both in the in the building layout that Marwa talked about and in the parks and, and, and transportation systems that Hugh talked about, how to make them work for safer cities. Okay, Marwa first. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, in in Syria hasn't hasn't been, let's say, attacked or had wars and conflicts for the first time now. I guess we live in in a place where it was blessed in a way that it, it has so many uh, resources, and w whether it's human or natural, that it is also a curse in a way that always there is someone who wishes to, let's say, divide and conquer in a ways and create those from within and from the outside. So the good news is that it, over the, the thousand years that this place has lived, it always proved that it can, they call it the rising phoenix in a way, it always come back into uh, uh, some term of peace. I guess that the Ottomans, in, in, because we had in the 18, uh, 1860s, we had similar chaos. But I think the Ottomans, uh, we can learn because the Ottomans have stayed for 400 years. Some of it, most of it was very good and the last chapter was uh, bad. So people would refer only to the last chapter. But I guess they, they did so many good and innovative, in a way, uh, strategies into reintegrating people again and bringing all the different backgrounds again because we've always lived in in a place where we weren't one color in any way we always had all those different communities and different uh, um, races and ref different uh, civilizations living together so that's why i feel very passionately about the old cities because they carry so many lessons most, many of them were demonstrated in your in your uh, presentation now, Gil. We had the nature, we had the walkability, we had uh, productive public spaces. It's not just public spaces. We had terms of uh, encounters and negotiation among people. Uh, a good example of which is... Uh, Maybe you could wind up now, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is the final thought. It's the, um, one uh, good example is the old souk, because... Yeah. The market is a very good public space where product, production and negotiations and encounters can happen. And in the soups, it's so intimate, it's so tight. You can almost reach each side of the, yeah. of the street. And, uh, and, and I think we've forgotten that and we've broadened things. A great uh, uh, Jim, Jim talked about road diets. This is a, a great fad in the States at the moment about how we make our roads slimmer, how we use our tarmac in a different way. Um, Gil, do you want to follow up with that? Yeah, I think that we, not only in Bogota but anywhere, the government has to intervene in the issue of housing. Supply and demand works when there is supply and there is demand. If I'm making glasses and I charge too much money, then George makes him charge less and the price comes down. The land is fixed. 
So it doesn't matter how much demand there is, the supply is going to be the same. So country after country, when you leave it up to the, the law of the jungle, that supply and demand, you end up sending the poorest people to the worst places, the least viable to urbanize, to bring jobs and transit and education and health and everything. Uh, so one of the things is I find that government need to intervene. The places where you have least how problems of housing, like uh, the Scandinavian countries, huge restrictions from government. If you are foreigner, you cannot buy. Even if you are local, you cannot buy more than two houses in downtown Copenhagen. So there's huge. So in developing countries, the governments also have to intervene and create gigantic banks of land, do the urban area, and then uh, be able to get low-income people into, into good areas. In addition, having the mix is important. People see this 1.7 million people doing walking and cycling as something of, oh, it's fun, it's recreation. I see it is about social integration, about it. the only place, the only place in Bogota where the owners of the largest corporations and their families meet their minimum wage workers and their families doing the same activity is in that. So all of that also helps. And finally, the, the role of public spaces. Sometimes people say, oh, in the low income, don't worry about public space. They got other things to worry. Well, you know, when you live in a house that is only 300 square feet home, you don't live there. You sleep there. You live outside. So the low income areas need even better sidewalks and better parks and better bikeways and better connectivity with public transit and so and activating the parks. When we did over 800 parks in eight years, it wasn't just an issue of recreation. When you have that park, that is like a meeting place and you put lots of light then people get to know each other and you also improve the safety because you develop a sense of solidarity. When you know your neighbors and something is happening outside, you go out and help. If you don't know anyone, you shut the door and you stay inside. So it's a lot of activities, plus obviously having more police and cameras and all of this. But it's not just a, an issue of police. We've only got five minutes. Quick, very quick questions, quick answers, succinct answers. Yes. Uh, my question is to James. Um, you talked about having zero percent, um, aiming for a zero percent in uh, um, uh, juvenile, juvenile justice incarceration yeah, yes. within the criminal justice system. So the UK is, is currently implementing digital prisons, and I'm just wondering whether this how how is how does your policy support this? Because you know, even if you think about what's happening in America to, in America to people of African descent, there's a lot of uh, and rest, and there's a lot of suspicion. So, I'm quite interested in how you achieve that. Yeah. So I, I, I don't mean to suggest that we are there yet. I am suggesting it is a target. Uh, and the first fundamental reform is, what is it our police are going to do, right? Uh, what is it we train them to do? Do we train them to shoot unarmed people in the back as they run away, or do we teach them to de-escalate a crisis? To, to move and live in the community, to build the relationships. I mean, the, the hallmark of our sanctuary cities movement is that the police want to be engaged with the community and so that, so that people will come to the police not for crisis intervention, but as a matter of habit. And, and so it's an entirely cultural change shift in what police work should be. That's where I think it starts. And then how those officers engage, particularly with young people, comes after that. So it is a work in progress at the very least. Thank you. Okay. Yes, in the... Oh, right, okay. Sorry, quick one. One, um, yeah, two very quick ones. Um, Ingrid um, from Playing Out and Bristol Travel and City <coughs> talking about moving from talk into action for Bristol and the vision you had, Gail, of children, older people, poorer communities bit political, but George, what were the main barriers that stopped that for you in Bristol? And Gail, how can we kind of push through them? Well, very quickly from me, um, adults. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> they are, the, you know, that's the collective word for people who resist change, and kids love it. Um, so I absolutely believe in letting kids lead much more in our cities. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have votes. Um, Gail. But we gotta make the case because their parents do vote. So we gotta tell the, teach the parents 
Also, the children are fantastic for engagement. Even you just get children to do some workshop and do drawings. How does your community look like when you, are, when you have your parents' age? And they're going to put trees and green spaces and people walking and cycling. And they're going to teach us what to do. But also, we need to, we, we need to engage and we need to be activists. This is not, change is hard. Change, you know, three, three short things on change. One, it is not unanimous. If you want it to be unanimous, you have to water it down so it's not going to happen. Two, the general interest must prevail over the particular. So any public meeting, say, any idea has to be start with the general interest. And three, when you say no to something, you're also saying yes to something else. So when you say, oh, no, we're not going to have bike ways. Okay, we're going to have more sprawl, more obesity, more issues of mental health, and so on. Thank you. Last question from Liz Seidler from Happy City. Um, very, yeah, a, a very good uh, last questioner. Okay, Thanks for Liz. the plug. It's not actually going to be about Happy City at all. Um, you talked about a sense of urgency, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you talked about a gentleman majority and those adults. We need to change their minds. If each of the, the um, panel members, if you had one really simple, actionable, ideally very cheap bit of advice for how we could get more of the gentle majority feeling that sense of urgency and acting towards the kind of cities you've just really inspiringly described, what would it be? Thank you. Perfect last question. I didn't plant it. Andrew. <laughs> I mean, for my issue, it needs leadership and it needs that willingness to grasp hold of something that is horrible, but with the hope and the vision that we can actually end slavery within 40 years. Yeah. For me, I think taxation on on residency. I mean, uh, because I think it begins when people are pushed to the side. This is a global issue that ended in war and on, in our country. I hope it won't, won't end uh, as it is for the rest of the, the cities. But I think people have the right to live in the city, in the around the center, and uh, so many people are buying more than they need. So many people are making it a hotel for them where they are living other places. So tax those people and let the people of the place live in it. Thank you, Jim. Uh, a, a concerted effort to have government actively engage the non-traditional citizens, that is to say, those who will not show up at a city council meeting at seven o'clock on a Tuesday, all they need to do is be sure they use this better. Right? Uh, young people want to engage with their cities with this, not in a face-to-face -face conversation. And most city officials that I have found don't want to work that way, don't know how to work that way, but the technology lets you do it and you'll have a much more engaged populace to solve problems. And don't be abusive on it. Uh, Gil. My one share. message is if everything that you do in the city, if it's not good enough for an eight-year-old and for an 80-year-old, then it's not good enough. Uh, and citizens can no longer be spectators. Citizens need to participate, go to the public meetings, write, write to the elected officials, write to the media, be active, participate. If you don't do that, then uh, you're not, someone else is doing it and that someone else is gonna set the policy. So be at the table, because you know, when, when they are deciding whether they put trees or they want in the sidewalks, they do, do bike ways. Because if you're not at the table, you are, not, you are gonna be on the menu and you, you don't wanna be on the menu. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew, Bauer, Jim and Gil. Just do it. And we've got to be out now for the next session.